Hello, Center Point Church. So glad you can join us today on this Sunday to worship our Lord. Let's give him all the praise that he's worthy of. Amen. Here we go. Chains are gone, gone. Now my sin is dead and gone, and I sing hallelujah. Done, done. He is risen, it is done, and I sing hallelujah. Praise is a weapon that will
is my surrender. This is my surrender. Thank you, Heavenly Father. We worship you and we praise you on this wonderful day that you have gifted us. Jesus, we surrender everything to you, all of our dreams, our goals, anything that we may be going through, Father, we just surrender it all to you. We place it all at your feet. We give you all control. We give you all the control of our, in our lives, Father. We praise you. We honor you. We glorify you. Have your way in us, Jesus. We just pray to have your way in us. In your precious name we say amen. Well, hello everyone. Welcome to Center Point. My name's Brett. I'm the online campus pastor, and I am so glad that you are here today, right now, wherever you're watching from, to join together online to worship our God. And we are having a great Sunday today. We just had an awesome time of worship and song, and we're gonna continue our worship in just a few moments. But before we do that, I wanna welcome all of you who may be here for the very first time, checking out Center Point here online. We're so glad to have you here today as our guest. And we want you to feel comfortable and be familiar with online church. So I just have a couple of things I wanna point out to you. First is take advantage of our community here in the chat. We have a great chat that goes on throughout the service. Introduce yourself there. Don't be afraid. Let us know where you're watching from. Uh, we'd love to get to know you a little bit there. But also, if you're here for the first time, check out our digital connect card. It's a great way for us to know that you are here with us and we'd love to get to know you a little bit more, see how we might answer any questions you have and find how we can best serve you. So check out our Connect card at some point today and we look forward to connecting with you throughout the week. And one other thing, if you have prayer in, uh, needs in your life today that you'd like to be connected with someone to pray with you live, uh, go ahead and hit that prayer button, the request prayer button, to be connected to one of our pastors or prayer team leaders. We'd love to pray with you at any point during the service today. So please don't be afraid to hit that prayer button if you'd like some prayer uh, today. Now we're gonna be hearing from our lead pastor, Pastor Brian McMillan, as he continues our sermon series, Lead Like Jesus. And we're gonna be hearing from him in just a few moments, but I wanna point out one other thing. Today is special because it's Communion Sunday, which means that at the end of that message, I'm gonna be coming back out and I'm gonna lead us in communion together. So now is a great time to go ahead and get the bread and get the cup so that you'll be ready to go if you wanna partake of communion with us together. Uh, just in a little bit after this, after the message. So now's a great time. Make sure you get everything ready so you'll be good to go. One last thing for those of you who have come prepared to give today, remember the way to give online is to go to cpchurch.com slash give. So if that's you, if you've come prepared to worship through your giving, head to cpchurch.com slash give or click on the link that you'll see appear in the chat uh, below. With all that said, guys, God bless, I'll see you guys in the chat. Hey guys, my name is Justin and I have the privilege of being the young adults pastor here at Centerpoint Massapequa. And we know that being a young adult can be a really confusing time in your lives. It often feels like there are way more questions than answers for you. And you'll often reach for the first answer that you're given. Topics like dating and marriage can feel like a pretty loaded conversation. Well. If you're between 18 to 29 years old and attend any of our campuses or live anywhere in Long Island, we are inviting you to join us for a conference where we'll teach about God's perspective on singleness, dating, sex, marriage, and more. We'll also provide dinner, amazing worship, and breakout sessions on several topics. It's also a great time to connect with young adults from all over Long Island. Now the conference is $30, but from now until May 7, we have an early bird special for $25. So, what are you waiting for? Sign up now and don't miss in the DMs.
everyone is a leader. Whether it's your family, at the fire station, in a classroom, life group, or friend circle, we all lead. Yet leadership skills are something that need to be developed and fostered. We need a teacher. As Christians, if we're going to look for someone to teach us about leadership, shouldn't it be the greatest leader the world has ever known? Join Centerpoint in its new series, Lead Like Jesus, to learn leadership principles that will bring change to your family, workplace, church, and community. Our new series, Lead Like Jesus. Well, hello, Centerpoint. It is so great being able to teach and connect with you today, uh, especially, I got some big news. This is really, really exciting. Right now, today, for the first time, we have a campus in Pennsylvania, Stroudsburg, Pennsylvania, campus number seven. And the reason is we actually just have our men's retreat going on and all the men are watching this right now. Gentlemen, I'm sorry I had to leave early, but I have to do what I have to do. 82 men in PA learning about God. It has been a great, great weekend. And so men, I hope that you're having an awesome Sunday. And of course, to all of our campuses all across the island, Brooklyn to Montauk, God is doing such awesome things here at Center Point. Hey, we are in this new series, Lead Like Jesus. And last week, we're in week one, and we learned that leaders understand multiplication. That this is the idea that Jesus had and how his kingdom was going to advance across the entire world was through multiplying himself into others who will multiply themselves into others. I believe last Sunday was in many ways a culture shift for us as a church, really stressing the importance of making sure that everyone in our church who has a level of maturity is willing to help disciple someone and that everyone as they grow in maturity would then be willing to disciple someone else. And if you were just kind of challenged last week and you thought to yourself, I would love for someone to help me walk in my faith because I have all these questions and I don't know who to go to. We have a bunch of people that have stepped up and say, I want to disciple others and help them with the knowledge I have gained. So go to your campus pastor uh, talk to Pastor Brett online. We would love to help you find someone to bring you along in the journey as well. Now today, I want to talk about the second principle in our Lead Like Jesus series, which is called servant leadership. Servant leadership. You know, I was thinking through this week, why do people desire to be in positions of leadership? And at the end of the day, there's only one reason that people want to be a leader. Uh, they want the power of it. Now I say power and you instantly think, oh, power is bad, but that is not the case at all. Uh, power is really just the capacity or the ability to direct or influence the behavior of others. This isn't right or wrong. This is how things get done and people need to be in power and positions of leadership if anything is ultimately going to move forward. And as we learned last week, leadership is influence which makes power then the ability to get things done. Power is what allows leaders to ultimately lead. But the motivation of why people want power starts to get more to the morality of power. For example, there are often good reasons for wanting power and wanting to lead. For example, you want to change things. You see wrong and you want to right that wrong. You want to improve things. You want to make something better. And you know you have to lead to be able to get it there. Unfortunately, though, there's also wrong reasons for wanting leadership and wanting power. Selfish reasons or destructive reasons and even worse, oppressive reasons. People wanting power because they want praise. They want respect. It's about them. They want their desires ultimately fulfilled. And we know power can help accomplish that. Uh, we learned this important lesson from Spider-Man Far From Home, right? What a great movie. Spider-Man wrestling with what power and leadership means now that Iron Man is gone, trying to fill those shoes, feeling the weight of it, but not feeling ready for it. Then you have Mysterio, who just wants it all for himself. Great theological lessons there in Spider-Man Far From Home. And I said this a few weeks ago, 
when we were doing the series on Lord. The truth is people can't often handle power. You see, our own sin nature is too corrupt. Sin will always twist power. And since every one of us are sinful, every one of us has evil within us, anyone can distort power and make it for something other than what God would want us to do with it. And Jesus knew this. And Jesus knew that he was going to expect something radically different for his kingdom. He was going to expect his disciples to see leadership, to see power in a very different way. And he wanted a radically different approach to leadership and to power. He was going to call them and call us to servant leadership. And to see and know this, I think one of the best places in scripture that helps us understand servant leadership is in Mark chapter 10. I'd love for you, if you can, to, to open your Bibles. If you're in a super dark room, we'll make sure the words are on the screen right now. Mark chapter 10, I'm going to start at verse 35. It says, then James and John... The sons of Zebedee, which by the way, I really hope in the next year, someone has a kid in our church and names them Zebedee. I'm going to put this out there here, official. If you have a son and you name them Zebedee, I will personally, I'm promising you, I guarantee this, I will give you $100, right? Now, if that's not a good enough reason to name your son Zebedee, I don't know what is. But we have these brothers, James and John, two of the disciples, and they came to Jesus and they said, teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. Jesus says, what do you want me to do for you? They replied, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in glory. How mind-blowing is this? The audacity of these two. You see, in Jewish culture, whoever was at the center had the most prominent place, but then right there at the left and right would have been the next most important place. And these brothers are like, we want that spot. We want to be your, your most famous people. We want everyone to know how much you love us, how important we are to you. Verse 38, Jesus says, you don't know what you are asking. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. But to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. When the 10, the other 10 disciples heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. Jesus called them together, now all the disciples, and he said, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. And right here comes the contrast. Jesus is gonna create a dichotomy of leadership of the world's leadership versus what he is going to call his people in regards to leadership. And he says the Gentiles, they lord their leadership over their subjects. Uh, they make their leadership about them, about their power, about their influence, about their prestige, about their wealth. It is all about the leader, not the people that they are leading and he says, this is this top-down leadership. You serve the leader, end of story. But then Jesus says this in verse 43, not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. Jesus is saying, my true disciples don't want power for their own glory. They will want power first and foremost to serve others. And you know, what's interesting is Jesus says this, he clearly mentions slavery. And as I was going through this, I'm like, you know what? I, I think there's a lot of misconceptions um, that are out there about what the Bible says about slavery. And this is a huge sidetrack that I don't necessarily want to go down in this message, but I, I, I feel I just need to kind of put this out there when it comes to scripture in this idea of slavery. So, so let me deviate for a moment. 
Because when Jesus uses the term slave, you have to understand it's in context of first century Palestine. It is a very different word and understanding than when we hear slavery as Americans. American slavery was one race subjugating another race. It was ethnic Europeans enslaving Africans. It was pure evil. It was atrocious. And it showed the worst in humanity and our sin nature. Now, slavery in first century Palestine was evil too. Don't get me wrong, but it was different. For example, you could be a slave to someone of your own ethnicity. It wasn't simply one race against another, even though there were certainly some races that were more likely to be enslaved than others. But it could happen for so many reasons. It could happen because you had a huge amount of debt. It could happen because you were an abandoned child. You could even subjugate yourself into slavery under a master because you were so poor you thought being a slave would provide a better life. And after all that was said and done, you could even pay your way out of slavery. And that being said, I know that for us, it's a hard word to hear and it should be. And the Bible has been misused, especially in white American South to justify slavery in our past. Yet you also need to know, friends, that the Bible laid the groundwork to end slavery. And so many Christians fought because of their biblical convictions to defeat it. And so when Jesus talks about slavery here, it's different than the way that we would often hear it as Americans. Now, with all that being said, because it's such a loaded word, I want to make sure that you don't miss Jesus's point. He is saying that you might think you deserve to be in the highest position in society. But as a follower of Christ, the highest position is saying, I am actually a servant of all. It's being willing to put yourself in the lowest position if you're a follower of Christ. And then finally, Jesus drops the bomb on this conversation with his disciples. When he says in verse 45, for even the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. <laughs> See this cup and baptism that Jesus had just mentioned, uh, these two images of Christ on the cross was something only he was going to be able to do. His willingness to die for the sin of the world. No one else could take and drink of that cup and have that exact baptism. You will be baptized through him. You'll drink of the cup through him, but no one could be the original. Only Jesus could do that. To go through this pain that is uncomprehendable for you and for me, amen? We can't fathom what Jesus went through and he did it. And he did it for us. And friends, it shows that Jesus is the ultimate example of servant leadership. Think about it. Jesus is Lord. He is God. He is perfectly holy. He is worthy of all praise. And when you think about who he is, he's the one that deserves everyone to serve him. Amen? Everyone to serve him. Yeah, what does Jesus do? Jesus steps into humanity and he serves humanity and not just a little, not just like a slight inconvenience. He serves us to the cross. He emptied himself of his power. He died for our sins. Whoever puts their faith in him will be saved. Our sin will be forgiven. That is leadership. That is servant leadership. And now Jesus calls us to serve and lead like he has. It's a big calling, friends. And I want to take a moment to break down what I see in Christ, what I think I see we need to do if we're going to, in fact, be servant leaders. And here's the first one. To be a servant leader, you need to be secure in your identity in Christ. Because I got to tell you, this idea of servant leadership, Jesus even said himself, this is not like the Gentiles. This is not like the world. Doing this is stupid outside of knowing Christ. It just is. It's like, this is nuts. 
Who would actually do this? Why would you actually do it? And you would only do it because you understand who Christ is, what he has done for you, and you want to follow his example. You want to live for Christ. You see, for us as Christians, leadership isn't about making our names known. That is not our end goal. Where leadership for most, that is their end goal. We lead to make the name of Jesus famous. That's very different. The whole motivation for leadership first and foremost in all realms of the world isn't about us. It's about him to live in such a counterculture way that people realize that there is something different about us. And ultimately it's who we serve. That as we're given leadership, as we're given power, as we're given influence, we don't use it to simply build ourselves up. We don't take advantage of every opportunity for simply ourselves. We use the leadership God gives us and allows us to have and appoints us into so we can build Jesus up. And Christ says to his disciples, who will be the pillars, the leaders of the church, who will be setting the example, you do this by being servants. And at the end of the day, friends, unless you take your Christian faith seriously, unless you understand your identity in Christ, unless you understand that you've been saved by him, unless you understand you've been called on mission by him, unless you understand that you've been called to be a disciple of him, as we talked about last week, there's no way you will apply this to your life because it's so radically different than how the world looks at leadership. It starts with being secure in your identity in Christ. And then once we do that, if we're willing to say, okay, I get who Jesus is, I get what he has called me to do, then there's the next motivation. To be a servant leader, you need to be motivated then by love. You need to be motivated by love. I love Philippians chapter two. Verse two, this is what Paul writes to the church. He says, make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. He's challenging the church to this idea of oneness and they're doing it out of the same love they have for each other. And then he says in verse three, to do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, rather in humility, value others above yourselves. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. In essence, what Paul is doing right now is he's giving us a definition of servant leadership. Uh, to, To have a motivation in your life that is primarily based because of your identity in Christ to now love others. And loving others keeps you from selfish ambition. Loving others is going to keep you from vain conceit. It's going to keep you from having a coveting attitude. It's going to say, if you win, then we all win. I can celebrate what is good in your life. And I even want to help you get there. Friends, our leadership needs to look the same way. That we have a love for humanity because we see that each human being, and we come back to this often, is made in the image of God. And they are valuable to God. And as a result of that, we have a responsibility as God's people, his ambassadors, to love them like he loves them. And so as we lead, we're not going to lead simply for ourselves. We're going to lead with love to help others and improve their life and improve their circumstance and let them know that they're not alone and to build them up. And friends, as Jesus loves those around you, you know you need to love those around you as well. The same way that he has loved you. So what then does servant leadership look like? Uh, We understand the call. We understand some of the characteristics. So how does this get practical, right? Like, what do you do with this? How how does this now start to influence our life? I want to give you three areas that I think we could be servant leaders. I, I think that we could be servant leaders in our marriage, in our workplace, and in the church. And so let's start. I believe that you should be a servant leader in your marriage, now, let's just 
Say hypothetically, you have children. As a parent, this is very easy when it comes to our kids in the sense of our family. Uh, this becomes very easy because uh, kids are kind of, uh, in our day and age, they are so well taken care of. It's, uh, it's a whole different de- time. I mean, telling your kids you love them is standard, where for a man, maybe 50 years ago, that may not have been the case. And if anything, we may lift our children up with too high of a regard and let them get away with too much. But being a servant leader to our children comes very natural for most people. Serving their kids for the benefit of their kids and their life ultimately. If anything, I should have waited two weeks and made this the Mother's Day lesson, right? Could have just, just gushed on moms, how you're servant leaders, how you crush it for your children. And, and so hey, I'm just going to say that now. You just replay this in two weeks and realize I said, moms, you're amazing, And dads, you are too. Dads get a bad rap sometimes. They make us into the Homer Simpsons. Oh no. Dads are there involved. They're loving their kids. They're serving their kids in such a beautiful way. Servant leadership when it comes to the kids is easy. Now when servant leadership gets really hard is when we start to see it towards our spouse. For the men, off of the men's retreat right now, you may want to stay up there another couple of days, all right? With what I'm about to share, you may be like, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna wait. Hey, dear, I'm, I'm really feeling the Lord is moving in my life right now. I'm gonna stay here until next week, until you forget everything Pastor Brian just said. But when it comes to the marriage, this gets so much harder. And we all struggle with this because in marriage, there have been these fights and these, these wars that have been waged and we've, we've put up barricades emotionally and we're trying to always get our way. And so we don't want to give anything because we fought so hard to get where we're at. Yeah, when it comes to our marriage, it must be the most important place to understand this concept of Jesus of servant leadership. You know, I I think there's often a misconception when it comes to husbands and wives that in Christianity, there's often this idea that that wives are supposed to do whatever the husbands tell them to do. And, and, And that's the paradigm of the family. But I want you to know, I don't believe that's true at all. You know, the Apostle Paul... <clears throat> writes in Ephesians chapter five, a whole section on marriage. And I love the first line because the first line sets up the tone of everything else he's about to say. Because in Ephesians five twenty one, regarding marriage, Paul says, submit to one another out of the reverence of Christ. Do you hear that church? Husbands, wives, submit to one another out of the reverence of of Christ. He's saying, be a servant leader to one another. He's saying, care about this other person with such a level of intentionality that you're loving them in such a way that you're being Christ-like to them in such a way that you are building them up, that you are looking out for the best of them, that you are serving them. Men, hear me, hear me. You are not the kings of the castle. That is a wrong way of looking at manhood and being a husband. You're not the king of the castle. You're a servant leader in your home. Ladies, you are not the queen of the land. Your family isn't there to serve you and lift you up. No, you are there to be a servant leader. And as you as husbands and wives lead your family, you serve your family. You're doing out of your identity in Christ and the love that you have for each other. Husbands serving their wives, wives serving their husbands. I do very few weddings anymore. My, my schedule is just uh, too intense and I, I, I don't have that much time, but I, I tend to do three or four weddings still in the year and I just did one last week and I remember as I'm looking <coughs> into the eyes of this couple about to get married, it started to actually rain and I got to my point fast, far faster than I do on a Sunday. And I said to them, uh, I, I, as I looked at them, you have to understand the importance of serving each other. Don't lose that. And so we need to be servant leaders in our home. I believe that we should also be servant leaders in our workplace. 
We need to be servant leaders in your workplace. I'll give you an example. Uh, we have a large church. Many are going to be hearing this, and, and maybe you are out there and you own your business. Maybe you are a boss, or maybe you're a manager. You have some people underneath you. Hear me. If you're a Christian leader, you're a servant leader at work as well, which means you're not to simply take from your employees, but you're to help put them on the road to success because they're made in the image of God. They have value. They matter. And so when you see your employees, they're not simply there to do a job description that you tell them to. You need to be trying to help them to the best of your ability within a level of being fair and reasonable to help their life, to improve their life, to bring a level of maybe even joy into their life that when they interact with you, that, that it's not always just putting them down or putting more weight upon their shoulders because you are a servant leader to them. Now, I know this gets a little, little foggy. Like, what does that mean? What does that look like? I, I don't know because I don't know your personality. I don't know your position, but I do know this. This needs to be something you are thinking about and processing in the role that you're in. The answers may not always be clear, but the heart attitude needs to be clear. Maybe you're not a a boss or a manager. You're like, I'm off the hook. No, you're not. Because you still have coworkers. You still have other people around you, which means you need to be a servant leader to them. Not simply trying to get above them, get ahead of them, but to say, how can I help them? How can I serve them? Uh, Maybe you work in a, a realm that you have customers. Well, How can you put your customer first, not simply your bottom line or your commission? How do you not force a sale that's unnecessary? Friends, there's so many ways that if we're going to honor God and live counterculture, that this idea of servant leadership is going to, to creep into even our vocational level. Because those people are not simply customers, they're not simply employees, they're not simply co-workers. They are made in the image of God and they are valued by God. And the way that you treat them is going to show that you are radically different than everyone else. And it's going to give glory to God. And we need to see that, friends. We need to understand this place that he has called us to. And if, by the way, if you are a boss, you are a manager, when there is an opening in your company or in your department, people should go out of their way to try to get you a resume because you have such a reputation of being fair and of being caring. That doesn't mean you don't fire someone when they do a poor job. Of course, that needs to happen. But there's such a reputation about your character and the way you treat people that anyone says, man, if there's an opening there, I want that. Why? Because you are a servant leader of Jesus Christ. Lastly, I believe that we should be servant leaders in our church. Servant leaders in our church. And I want to end by talking about this because I want to cast a little vision and explain a little bit of the values that we have here at Centerpoint. You know, there have been a lot of headlines lately about prominent church leaders that have fallen. Every time I read another one or see another one, it always breaks my heart because they fall into sin and that sin has disqualified them from vocational ministry. And I got to tell you, I I know that there are a lot of reasons why pastors end up falling. But I I think this one right here is one of the big ones. I'm convinced that this idea of servant leadership and pastors falling are completely tied together. Because when leaders start making the church about them, they forget that they are here to serve and not be served. See, servant leadership keeps you humble. Servant leadership keeps it about the people. It keeps your heart in check and your identity in Christ in check. And when you no longer, as a spiritual leader, see yourself as a servant, servant leader, you're going to very quickly find yourself walking down other paths of sin and entitlement. But listen, I believe that desiring power and leadership in the church is good. I don't want to dissuade you from saying, okay, a servant leader means that I never want to lead. I never uh, want to take on a life group or maybe feel called to ministry because there needs to be so many more leaders in the church and pastors in the church. Paul says in 1 Timothy 3.1, here's a trustworthy saying, whoever aspires to be an overseer desires a noble task. 
He's like, it's good if you have leadership gifts that God has given you and you want to use them as an overseer, which is a, a title like elder or pastor. It's like, that's good if you desire this. Desiring leadership's good. We just have to make sure that our heart is in the right place as we do it. And I also think it's really important for you as the congregation to know that you have a position, you have a place that you need to see yourself when it comes in regards to the spiritual leaders God has raised up. You need to be willing to give honor to the spiritual leaders in your church. You need to be willing to give them spiritual authority into your life if they're going to lead you well. I'll show you what I mean. Paul again in 1 Timothy 5.17 says the elders who direct the affairs of the church well are worthy of double honor, especially those whose work is preaching and teaching. And Paul's saying, no, we need to honor our spiritual leaders. We need to give them this position of, of respect because of what they're doing and how they're leading the church because God is using them. And it's the grace of God in their lives that allows them to do what they do. And so, so we need to honor our spiritual leaders and we also need to give them spiritual authority in our lives. The writer of Hebrews chapter 13 verse 17 says this. He says, have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority because they keep watch over you as those who must give an account. Do this so that their work will be a joy, not a burden, for that would be of no benefit to you. And you might be wondering, Brian, why are you bringing this up right now? I thought we were talking about servant leaders, and I'm going to tell you why. Because I believe that the church must have this super healthy balance. If it's ultimately going to do what scripture calls us to do, and everyone has the right attitude within the church. Because if the pastors are called to be servant leaders, they're called to have humble hearts, then if they're to do that, then the church must allow them to do it by giving them a place of honor and letting them have authority in their life. Because if both aren't there, this whole thing falls apart. There's a balance that God has given and this only works when the church leaders understand that they are here as servants but the church body understands that they are here to let them serve them and lead them. And so please hear me center point. I believe with all of my heart that we have in fact a culture at center point of spiritual, of servant leadership. I am convinced, and I know every one of our pastors well, and I know most of our leaders well, but I can say that every one of our pastors is a servant here. They are humble. They are doing this job because they love you. They're leading their campuses because they want to serve you. They want to see the gospel move forth. Every pastor here will do any job that is needed to be done. And there's not a task that they would ask you to do that they wouldn't do themselves. This is a place that understands and applies servant leadership. And we also have a deliberate culture to avoid creating celebrities and trying to make leaders into kings. You know, a lot of multi-campus churches, and I'm not saying there's a right or wrong to this, but many multi-campus churches do a broadcast every Sunday. It's always a video primarily from the primary communicator, the lead pastor. We deliberately chose to do things different because we didn't want to make center point about one person. I didn't want to make it about Brian McMillan. I wanted to raise up leaders and raise up preachers and raise up pastors. And so we do this often enough for a sense of unity and a central teaching across the board. But hear me, we want our campus pastors to be empowered because we don't want to make it about a person. We want to make it about Jesus and make it about his vision. Here in Massapequa, I only preach 50% of the time. That is extremely rare for a lead pastor. Why? Because I don't want it to be about me. I want people to come in any Sunday and having no idea who's going to preach because they're not coming for a preacher. They're coming for Jesus. Amen. It's the heart here at Center Point. And this staff here strives for this goal and we hold each other accountable to it. And I'm not saying that we do a perfect because you can't, but know this, we are trying to be leaders that lead with a servant heart and we hope that you can then become a congregation that is filled with a servant's heart as well. 
Listen, friends, we don't ask our church body to mow our lawns at our homes or to hold our Bibles when we preach or to chauffeur us around. At church, our pastors take out the trash and straighten the chairs in the sanctuary and clean the bathrooms. We give time to the wealthiest congregant as well as the poorest. There is no ring kissing on a Sunday. There's no throne sitting behind us and there's no bowing to the clergy here. This church is about Jesus. And for us, it's about serving you, not you serving us. Why? Well, as Jesus says, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. We want to be great in his eyes. And as it starts with the leadership of the church, it needs to continue to trickle down through each and every one of you that calls Center Point your home for you to come alongside your leaders as servants as well. That there is no job that is too small for you to do. That you shouldn't lead a life group or be on the worship team if you're not willing to also greet or make coffee on a Sunday. That you are never too successful in life to come to church and think you're above pushing a vacuum. That you don't just talk to the best dressed or those driving the nicest cars, but you look for anyone with a friendly face or even an upset face on a Sunday, Sunday to talk to. That there are no divas, celebrities, CEOs, influencers, or social elites here. Just ordinary servants of our God most high. Amen. Friends, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And if you are going to lead like Jesus, you need to be willing to serve like Jesus. Friends, I'm going to call up the worship team and a pastor from all of our campuses to lead us now in taking the Lord's Supper together. But I want to close in prayer. Will you bow your heads with me? Jesus, I thank you for this message and for this truth. And Jesus, thank you that you didn't just simply tell us what to do. You showed us what to do. Thank you for serving us, serving humanity, being willing to die on a cross. God, because we do not deserve that. Yet you've done it nonetheless. And may we take your example and take your call and be a church that serves those around us in the church, out of the church, all for your name and for your glory. May we lead like you and not the world. Jesus, we love you. We thank you. We praise you in your name. Amen. Amen. Well, hello again, friends. Now it's time to take communion together. So if you've prepared the bread and the cup, go ahead and get those ready now. I'm going to pray, and then I'm going to read a portion of scripture, and then I'll instruct us all to take the bread and take the cup together. Um, so now let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord Jesus, we come before your table once again, Lord in remembrance of your broken body and your shed blood poured out for us on the cross. This love, Lord, is one that we can't comprehend and we'll spend the rest of our lives trying to understand the fullness and the depth of the love that you've showed for us. God, that you loved us so much that you gave your son that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. This love is something we didn't deserve. While we were your enemies, Lord, you bestowed it upon us and poured it out for us. And you've given beauty for ashes. You've given love for hate. Jesus, our response to this is just complete humility complete humility before this unimaginable love. We thank you, Lord, for your great love for us, for your broken body and your spilled blood. And we remember your death and will continue to do so until the day you return and wipe every tear from every eye. 
We thank you, Lord. Amen. Let's grab the bread now. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's partake together. Now let's take the cup. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's partake together. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Friends, let's sing one last song of celebration before we go today.
Church. We are so glad you were able to join us today. We look forward to having you again next week. Take care and God bless.